Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a great Tuesday so far. And welcome to the first official day of online classes here at Metro Apologetics Spring 2020 Virtual Edition. So, uh, yeah, hope you're all having a great day. Uh, now, today we are going to start looking at the Trinity in Scripture and specifically in the Old Testament. So just to give you a little bit of a clue as to where we're going today. The other thing practically is, again, I'm going to try and keep these lectures to 12 to 15 minutes. I'm not going to do super long lectures when we do these topics. Um, and this week, every day, we will have a lecture. So you'll want to come on here, and I'll text you guys as well. But each day this week, plan on that. Going forward, especially if uh, we get an extended period of time online, you know, if we're not back in the classroom soon, uh, I'm not going to be doing lectures every single day. So don't worry, we won't be doing that every day. Uh, but for this week we will, because I've got some content that I really want to cover and get under our belts. So uh, yeah, with that said, uh, let me just pray for you guys real quick, and then we will get going here, looking at the Trinity in the Old Testament. So uh, Father, just pray that you bless our time today and speak to us. And Lord, bless all these students in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, um, today, like I said, we're looking at the Trinity in the Old Testament. Tomorrow and Thursday, we will look at the Trinity in the New Testament. Um, and then we'll also begin looking at the doctrine of the Trinity in the early church. And then Friday, we will finish up looking at the doctrine of the Trinity in the church during the days of uh, the medieval church and the Church of the Reformation. Uh, and then on into the modern day, of course. So that's kind of where we're going uh, this week. And so uh, we're also going to be looking at Lewis's mere Christianity throughout this week. So you guys will want to have that. Um, you'll need that, especially today and tomorrow, because I've got a little bit of a reading assignment for you guys. Uh, we're just going to look at a couple chapters in Lewis this week. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, as far as the Trinity goes, uh, this is one of those doctrines that is what we call an essential of the Christian faith. Okay, so there are some things that are not essential, right? Um, some churches like to do big bands, you know, with drums and guitars and fog machines and lasers, you know, and they sing the latest praise songs. Um, other churches, they prefer to do no musical instruments, just voices, and to sing only the psalms. Okay, that's a big thing, I think especially in certain Dutch Reformed churches. Now, other churches, most churches probably fall somewhere in the middle. They have bands and modern instruments, and they sing praise songs and hymns and that kind of stuff, right? The church is kind of all over the map on that, and I think that's fine, right? I think it's more just, you know, we worship God with the gifts he's given us, and, you know, if, if your church doesn't like musical instruments, okay. If your church does, great, right? But those are not essential issues, <clears throat> right? Those are secondary issues are even less important than that. You know, those are not things that we divide the church over, right, or that we, that we die for, you know. Um, some things are more important. Our view of the Bible, for example. Uh, you know, the church has always confessed the Bible to be the word of God. Uh, but there are certain theologies today and, and uh, that have been around, you know, for a couple hundred years where, you know, the Bible is not looked at as the word of God, okay? That is much more important. Uh, but then there are those issues that are what we would maybe call essential. In other words, issues where if you're not on board here, um, you, you really shouldn't call yourself a Christian, right? Uh, we've talked about this, for example. You know, uh, Muslims, right? The, the Islamic religion believes that there's one God and that he is not Trinity, right? Well, by definition, then, you, you can't call yourself a Christian. That's a different God than the God of the Bible, who is a trinity, right? So the trinity, that there's one God who exists in three eternal divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, this is something that we see all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testaments. This is something that has been confessed unanimously by the church for 2,000 years, okay? This is one of those essential issues, Okay, the Trinity. This is huge, right? This is, you know, level one issue. Okay, so that's why I wanted to touch on that uh, for this week, and I wanted to have us start looking at that. So today, 
we're only going to do sort of a cursory 30,000 foot view here in the Old Testament. There's just three simple passages that I'm going to have you guys look at with me. Uh, there's so much more that could be said about this, but for the sake of time, you know, and all of that, uh, we're just going to look really briefly today. So uh, first, I want to look at Genesis 126 and the Hebrew word Elohim. Okay, so Genesis 126 says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Okay, so you'll notice there, uh, when Moses was writing here, he said that God said, right? God, singular, one God. But then he says, let us make man in our image, okay? And in our likeness. You guys know from your English classes uh, with English grammar that our is a plural, all right? But the word God is singular, okay? Now that gets back to something in the original Hebrew in which Genesis was written that's very interesting. Uh, the word for God that Moses used here and, and most often used was the word Elohim, okay? And what that is in Hebrew, that's actually a plural word, okay? The interesting thing, though, is that when Moses uses the word Elohim, this plural word, to refer to God, he refers to God in the singular. So it's almost like a grammar issue here that doesn't quite make sense. But Moses did this on purpose, and the writers of Scripture all throughout the Old Testament do this on purpose in Hebrew. And what they're doing is they are showing you and me that there's only one God, right? Israel worships one God. They were monotheistic. But yet this one God is somehow a plurality, right? So it's this really interesting concept that we see revealed to us literally on the first page of Scripture in Genesis 1, and it follows all throughout the Old Testament. Okay? Um, so again, Israel's confession in the Old Testament was always that there's one God. Okay? Israel abhorred polytheism. They were never polytheistic uh, when it came to talking about the true, the true and living God, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, the God of Israel. Right? And yet they always referred to him as Elohim. Not El, which would be the singular form, right? But Elohim, this compound unity, right? Uh, and so it's an interesting, interesting grammatical thing with Hebrew uh, when we see this about God. And this is why God, singular, said, let us make man in our image, right? So in this mysterious, unique way, even from the very beginning of the Bible, we see this truth that God is Trinity, right? There's Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, the designations Father, Son, and Spirit will come into play later uh, in the Old Testament and then, of course, in the New Testament. Uh, but again, we're seeing glimpses of this right from the very beginning. God wants us to know who he is. Okay. Now, uh, in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 45, verses 6 and 7. Okay. Uh, the sons of Korah, they were the authors of this psalm, this song here. And they wrote this psalm to just as kind of like a, a almost a praise song to Israel's king. Okay. But as happens so often in Old Testament biblical literature, they start by talking about a human king and then they sort of transition into talking about God. Okay. That happens quite often when you're reading, especially the Old Testament and especially the Psalms. It happens a lot. And so uh, the sons of Korah here are praising the king, and then they start talking uh, about the Messiah. Okay? And here's what they say in verse 6. They say, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Okay, now this is talking about Messiah. Okay, the church has always understood uh, that the one who was anointed with the oil of joy above all of his companions was Jesus, okay, Israel's Messiah. All right, but this interesting thing here in this psalm is that the, the writers of the psalms here, inspired by God's Holy Spirit as they're writing scripture, they refer to the Messiah as God. 
okay, what's going on here? Your throne, O God. And this is talking about and talking to Messiah. Okay, so this is one place out of many in the Old Testament where we begin to see this idea that the Messiah, this one who would come, which we know is Jesus, this one who would come is divine. He is God. Okay, this is not a being that God creates and sends, right? This is not an angel that comes. This is not, you know, merely a good man. No, this is God. God himself is going to come. Okay, now in the book of Hebrews, in the New Testament, the author of Hebrews, he picks up on these verses here in chapter 1 of Hebrews, and he's talking about Jesus. And the author of Hebrews, in Hebrews 1 verse 8, says that God the Father said to the Son, which is Jesus, the Son of God, your throne, O God. Okay, do you follow that? So in Hebrews... These verses here are taken and specifically applied to Jesus Christ. Okay, so in the book of Hebrews, and I'll look at this a little bit more in depth tomorrow, God says to Jesus, your throne, O God. So God calls Jesus God in the New Testament in Hebrews. Okay, and so again, this is another place in the Old Testament where we're seeing this idea that there's only one God, but it seems almost, if we didn't know better, it seems like he's talking to himself, right? God is saying to himself, your throne, O God, talking, right? In that way, it's it's kind of this interesting thing here. Um, again, uh, these are hints, these are whispers that we're seeing, uh, indications of the Trinity here in the Old Testament, okay? And then finally, and just one more quick passage here that I want to look at, and then I will wrap this up. Isaiah chapter 6. Okay. So in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, we see something interesting that Paul picks up in the book of Acts, and we'll look at this tomorrow as well. <clears throat> but in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 through 10, uh, Isaiah writes this. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Again, us. There's that plural. And I said, here am I. Send me. God said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving, make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Okay? So this is God in the Old Testament speaking. Okay? Israel's God is saying these exact words. Now, we're going to see tomorrow how in the Gospel of John, John says that Jesus is the one who was speaking here. And then in the book of Acts, Paul says the Holy Spirit was the one who was speaking here. Okay, so in Isaiah, John, and Acts, we see that this statement that we just read is attributed to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? So again, as we look at Scripture and we interpret Scripture, Old and New Testament, we see this very, very clearly, this doctrine here, this revelation of the Trinity, right? That God is one. There's one God. Not three gods, not multiple gods. There's one God, but that he exists eternally as three distinct co-eternal, co-divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? It's, It's unmistakable in Scripture, right? Now, again, this is a very, very brief overview of this doctrine here, but I just wanted to give you a quick little introduction. Okay, so tomorrow we're going to look at this in the New Testament, uh, and we're going to talk again just about the importance of affirming and believing this, because this is something that, first of all, is clear in Scripture, and secondly, that the Christian church for 2,000 years uh, has deemed as truth and as essential doctrine. So it's very, very important, of the utmost importance. Okay, Um, so today I want you guys to look at mere Christianity. This is your assignment. And I want you to start on page 153. Uh, It's a chapter called Making and Begetting. And I want you to read pages 153 uh, to page 156. Just a few quick pages. And just keep some mental notes about that. And then we'll finish up reading that tomorrow and I'll make a few comments. But until then, have a great day. God bless you guys. And I will see you tomorrow.